was very anxious to clear that street so as to communicate with the camp of Pedro Alvarado and pass from one camp to the other. However, it was a day of great victory on land and water, both for us and the companies under Sandoval and Alvarado. We must now return to Bernal Diaz, who was with Pedro de Alvarado at Cuba, and go back to the 31st May, when Cortez fought his first battle on the lake. I will now relate what we did in our camp at Tacuba, for as we know that Cortez was going about the lake, we advanced along our causeway with great caution, and not like the first time. And when we reached the first bridge, the crossbowmen and musketeers, acting in concert, some firing while others loaded, Pedro de Alvarado ordered the horsemen not to advance with us, but to remain on dry land to guard our rear, fearing lest the pueblos I have mentioned through which we had passed should attack us on the causeway. In this way we stood sometimes attacking, at others on the defensive, so as to prevent the Mexicans reaching land from the causeway, for every day we had encounters, and in them they killed three soldiers, and we were also engaged in filling up the bad places. When we saw ourselves reinforced with the four launches sent by Cortez, Pedro de Alvarado ordered two of them to go on one side of the causeway and two on the other side, and we began to fight very successfully, for the launches vanquished the canoes which were wont to attack us from the water, and so we had an opportunity to capture several bridges and barricades. And while we were fighting, so numerous were the stones from the slings and javelins and spears, that they shot at us, although the soldiers were well protected by armor, they were injured and all wounded, and not until night parted us did we cease contending and fighting. From time to time the Mexicans changed about and relieved their squadrons, as we could tell by the devices and distinguishing marks on their armor. Whenever we left a bridge or barricade unguarded after having captured it with much labor, the enemy would retake and deepen it that same night and construct stronger defenses, and even make hidden pits in the waters, so that the next day, when we were fighting and it was time for us to retire, we should get entangled among the defenses. To prevent the launches from coming to our assistance, they had fixed many stakes hidden in the water, so that they should get impaled on them. When we drew off in the night, we treated our wounds by searing them with oil, and a soldier named Juan Catalan blessed them for us and made charms, and truly we found that our Lord Jesus Christ was pleased to give us strength in addition to the many mercies he vouchsafed us every day, for the wounds healed rapidly. Wounded and tied up in rags as we were, we had to fight from morning until night, for if the wounded had remained in camp without coming out to fight, there would not have been twenty men in each company well enough to go out. Then I wish to speak of our captains and ensigns and our standard bearers, who were covered with wounds and their banners ragged, and to declare that we had need of a fresh standard bearer every day, for we all came out in such a condition that they were not able to advance fighting and carry the banners a second time. Then, with all this, did we perchance have enough to eat? I do not speak of want of maize cakes, for we had enough of them, but of some refreshing food for the wounded. The cursed stuff that kept life in us was some herbs that the Indians eat, and the cherries of the country while they lasted, and afterwards tunas, which came into season at that time. Tlatelolco and the two towns on the lake had been warned by Guatemoc that on seeing a signal in the great queue of Tlatelolco, they should hasten to assist some in canoes and others by land, and the Mexican captains had been fully prepared and advised how and when and to what points they were to bring assistance. When we saw that however many water openings we captured by day, the Mexicans returned and closed them up again, we agreed that we should all go and station ourselves on the causeway in a small plaza, where there were some idle towers which we had already taken, and where there was space to erect our ranchos, although they were very poor ones, and when it rained we all got wet and they were fit for nothing but to cover us from the dew. We left the Indian women who had made bread for us in Tacuba, and all the horsemen and our friends the Tlaxcalans were left to guard them, and to watch and guard the passes so that the enemy should not come from the neighboring pueblos and attack our rear guard on the causeway while we were fighting. So, when once we had set up our ranchos where I have stated, thenceforward we endeavored quickly to destroy the houses and blocks of buildings and to fill up the water openings that we captured. 
we leveled the houses to the ground, for if we set fire to them, they took so long to burn, and one house would not catch fire from another, for each house stood in the water, and one could not pass from one to the other without crossing bridges or going in canoes. If we wanted to cross the water by swimming, they did as much damage from the azoteas, so that we were more secure when the houses were demolished. As soon as we had captured some barrier or bridge or bad pass where they offered much resistance, we endeavored to guard it by day and by night. This was the way in which all our companies kept guard together during the night. The first company, which numbered more than forty soldiers, kept watch from nightfall until midnight, and from midnight until two hours before dawn. Another company, also forty men, kept watch, and the first company did not leave their post, but we slept there on the ground. This second watch is called the Medora, and soon after forty soldiers came and kept the Alba, dawn, watch, which is the two hours until daylight. But those who watched the Medora could not leave, but had to stay there. So when dawn came, there were over one hundred and twenty soldiers all on watch together. Moreover, on some nights, when we judged that there was special danger, we kept watch together from nightfall until dawn, awaiting a great sally of Hakens, in fear that lest they should break through. On several nights, great squadrons came to attack us and break through at midnight, and others during the Medora, and others during the dawn watch, and they came sometimes without commotion, and at others with loud yells and whistles, and when they arrived where we were keeping night watch, what javelins and stones and arrows they let fly, and there were many others with lances, and although they wounded some of us, yet we resisted them, and sent back many of them wounded. Then, notwithstanding all the precautions we took, they would turn on us and open some bridge or causeway which we had captured, and we could not defend it from them in the night so as to prevent them doing it, and the next day it was our turn again to capture it and stop it up, and then they would come again to open it and strengthen it with walls, until the Mexicans changed their method of fighting, which I will tell you about in its proper time. The Mexicans still brought in much food and water from the nine towns built on the lake, so to prevent these supplies being brought to them, it was arranged between all the three camps that two launches should cruise in the lake by night and should capture all the canoes they were able and destroy or bring them to our camps. But even with all this, many laden canoes did not fail to get in, and as the Mexicans went about in their canoes carrying supplies, yet there was never a day when the launches did not bring in a prize of canoes and many Indians hanging from the yards. The Mexicans then armed thirty piraguas, which are very large canoes with especially good rowers and warriors, and by night they posted all thirty against some reed beds in a place where the launches could not see them. Then they sent out before nightfall with good rowers two or three canoes covered over with branches as though they were carrying provisions or bringing in water. In the track which, in the opinion of the Mexicans, the launches would follow them when they were fighting with them, they had driven numerous strong timbers made pointed like stakes so that they should get impaled on them. Then, as the canoes were going over the lake, showing signs of being afraid and drew near to the reed beds, two of our launches set out after them, and the two canoes made as though they were retreating to the land to the place where the thirty paraguas were posted in ambush, and the launches followed them. And as soon as they reached the ambush, all the paraguas together sailed, sallied out and made for the launches and quickly wounded all the soldiers, rowers, and captains. And the launches could go neither in one direction or another on account of the stakes that had been fixed. In this way, the Mexicans killed a captain named De Portilla, an excellent soldier who had been in Italy, and they wounded Pedro Barba, who was another very good captain, and they captured his launch, and within three days he died of his wounds. These two launches belonged to the camp of Cortez, and he was greatly distressed about it. Let us leave this and say that when the Mexicans saw that we were leveling all the houses to the ground, and all were filling up the bridges and openings, they decided on another way of fighting, and that was to open a bridge in a very wide and deep channel which we had to pass wading through the water, and it was sometimes out of our depth, and they had dug many pits which we could not see out of the water, and had made walls and barricades, both on the one side and the other of the opening, and had driven in many pointed stakes of heavy timber in places where our launches would run on to them, if they should come to our assistance when we were fighting to capture this fort. For they well knew that the first thing we must do was to destroy the barricade, and pass through that open space of water so as to reach the city. At the same time they had prepared in hidden places many canoes well manned with warriors and good rowers, 
On Sunday morning, 23rd June, great squadrons of warriors began to approach from three directions and attacked us in such a way that it was all we could do to hold our own and prevent them from defeating us. At that time, Pedro de Alvarado had ordered half the horsemen who used to stay in Tacuba to sleep on the causeway, for there was not so much risk as at the beginning, as there were no longer any Azoteas, for nearly all the houses had been demolished. To go back to my story, three squadrons of the enemy came on us very fearlessly, the one from the direction of the great open space of water, the other by way of some houses that we had pulled down, and the other squadron had taken us in the rear from the direction of Tacuba, and we were surrounded. The horsemen with our Tlachcalan friends broke through the squadrons that had taken us in the rear, and we all of us fought very valiantly with the other two squadrons until we forced them to retreat. However, that seeming flight that they made was a pretense. But we captured the first barricade where they made a stand, and we, thinking that we were victorious, crossed that water at a run, for where we passed there were no pits, and we followed up our advance among some great houses and temple towers. The enemy acted as though they were still retreating, but they did not cease to shoot javelins and stones from slings and mini arrows, and when we were least expecting it, a great multitude of warriors who were hidden in a place we were not able to see, and many others from the Azoteas and houses joined the combat, and those who had at first acted as though they were retreating turned round on us all at once and dealt us such treatment that we could not withstand them. We then decided to retreat with great caution, but at the water opening which we had captured, that is to say, at the place where we had crossed the first time, where there were no pits, they had stationed such a fleet of canoes that we were not able to cross at that ford, and they forced us to go across in another direction, where the water was very deep and they had dug many pits. As such, a multitude of warriors were coming against us, and we were in retreat. We crossed the water by swimming and wading, and nearly all of the soldiers fell in the pits. Then the canoes came down upon us, and there the Mexicans carried off five of our companions, and took them alive to Guatemoc and they wounded nearly all of us. Moreover, the launches which were guarding us could not come to our assistance because they were impaled on the stakes which had been fixed there, and from the canoes and Azoteas the Mexicans attacked them so fiercely with javelins and arrows that they killed three soldiers and rowers and wounded many of us. To go back to the pits in the opening, I declared, was a wonder that we were not all killed in them. Concerning myself, I may say that many Indians had already laid hold of me, but I managed to get my arm free, and our Lord Jesus Christ gave me strength, so that by some good sword thrusts I gave them I saved myself. But I was badly wounded in one arm, and when I found myself out of that water in safety, I became insensible and without power to stand on my feet, and altogether breathless. And this was caused by the great strain that I exerted in getting away from that rabble, and from the quantity of blood I had lost. I declare that when they had me in their clutches, that in my thoughts I was commending myself to our Lord God and to our Lady, his blessed mother, and he gave me the strength I have spoken of by which I saved myself. Thank God for the mercy that he vouchsafed me. There is another thing I wish to mention, that Pedro de Alvarado and the horsemen, when they had thoroughly routed the squadrons that came on our rear from Tacuba, did not any of them pass that water or the barricades, with the exception of one horseman who had come only a short time before from Spain. And there they killed him, both him and his horse. The horsemen were already advancing to our assistance when they saw us coming back in retreat, and if they had crossed there, and should have then had to retreat, there would not have been one of them, nor any of the horses, nor of us, left alive. Flushed with the victory they had gained, the Mahicans continued during that whole day, which, as I have said, was a Sunday to send a vast host of warriors against our camp, so vast that we could not prevail against them, and they expected for certain to rout us. But we held our own against them by the help of some bronze cannon and hard fighting, and by all the companies together keeping guard every night. Let us leave this, and say when Cortez heard of it, he was very angry. Then when we saw that it was our fault a great disaster had happened, we began then and there to fill in that opening, and although it meant great labor and many wounds which the enemy inflicted while we were at work, and the death of six soldiers, in four days we had filled it in, and at night we kept watch on the place itself, all three companies in the order I have already mentioned. Let me now say that the town situated in the lake when they saw how day by day we were victorious, both on water and on land, 
and that the people of Chalco, Tlaxcala, and other pueblos had made friends with us, decided to sue Cortez for peace, and with great humility they asked pardon if in any way they had offended us, and said that they had been under orders and could not do otherwise. The towns that came in were Itzapalapa, Churubusku, Kuluacan, and Mishquik, and all those the Freshwater Lake, and Cortez told them that we should not move the camp until the Mahagan sued for peace, or he had destroyed them by war. He ordered them to aid us with all the canoes that they possessed to fight against Mexico, and to come and build ranchos for Cortez and to bring him food. And they replied they would do so, and they built the ranchos, but brought very little food. However, our ranchos where we were stationed were never rebuilt, so we remained in the rain. For those who have been in this country know that through the months of June, July, and August, it rains every day in these parts. We made attacks on the Mexicans every day and succeeded in capturing many idle towers, houses, canals, and other openings and bridges which they had constructed from house to house. And we filled them all up with adobes and the timbers from the houses that we pulled down and destroyed, and we kept guard over them. But notwithstanding all this trouble that we took, the enemy came back and deepened them and widened the openings and erected more barricades. And because our three companies considered it a dishonor that some should be fighting and facing the Mexican squadrons and others should be filling up passes and openings and bridges, Pedro de Alvarado, so as to avoid quarrels as to who should be fighting or filling up openings, order that one company should have charge of the filling in and look after that work one day, while the other two companies should fight and face the enemy, and that this should be done in rotation, one day one company, another day another company, until each company should have had its turn. And owing to this arrangement, there was nothing captured that was not raised to the ground, and our friends the Lashkalans helped us. So we went on penetrating into the city, but at the hour for retiring, all three companies had to fight in union, for that was the time when we ran the greatest risk. First of all, we sent all the Tlaxcalans off the causeway, for it was clear that they were considerable embarrassment when we were fighting. Guatemoc now ordered us to be attacked at all three camps at the same time, by all his troops, and with all the energy that was possible, both on land and by water. And he ordered them to go by night during the Medora watch, so that the launches should not be able to assist us on account of the stakes. And they came on us with so furious an impetus that had it not been for those who were on the watch, over 120 soldiers, well used to fighting, they would have penetrated into our camp, and we ran a great risk as it was, but by fighting in good order we withstood them. However, they wounded 15 of our men, and two of them died of their wounds within eight days. Also in the camp of Cortez they placed our troops in the greatest straits and difficulties, and many were killed and wounded, and in the camp of Sandoval the same thing happened, and in this way they came on two successive nights, and many Mexicans also were killed in these encounters, and many more wounded. When Guatemoc and his captains and priests saw that the attack that they had made on those two nights profited them nothing, they decided to come with all their combined forces at the dawn watch and attack our camp and they came on so fearlessly that they surrounded us on two sides, and had even half defeated us and cut us off, when it pleased our Lord Jesus Christ to give us strength to turn and close our ranks, and we sheltered ourselves to a certain degree with the launches. And with good cut and thrust, and advancing shoulder to shoulder, we drove them off. In that battle they killed eight and wounded many of our soldiers, and they even injured Pedro de Alvarado. To return to Cortez's account of his doings, 24th June. When on my return to camp in the evening of the 24th June, I heard about Pedro de Alvarado's reverse, I decided to go to his camp on the following morning and reprimand him for what had happened and to see how far he had advanced and where he had placed his camp. When I arrived there, I was astonished to see how far he had penetrated into the city and the formidable passes and bridges which he had captured, and having seen them, I could not impute much blame to him. And after talking over what was to be done, I returned to my own camp. I made several advances into the city during the next few days, and was everywhere victorious. However, we had now been continuously fighting for more than twenty days, and every attack exposed us to great risk, for the enemy were united, and powerful and ready to fight to the death. 
The Spaniards, irritated at the delay, importuned me to advance and capture the marketplace of Tlaltelopo, for having gained that the enemy would have little space in which to defend themselves, and if they would not give in, would die of hunger and thirst, for they had nothing to drink but the salt water of the lake. When I demurred to this plan, your majesty's treasurer, Julian de Alderete, told me that the whole camp was set on it, and I ought to do it, and in the end they pressed me so greatly that after a consultation with others, I gave way. The next day, 29th June, I called together the most important persons in the camp, and we agreed to give notice to Sandoval and Pedro Alvarado that on the following day we should advance into the city and endeavor to reach the marketplace of Tlaltelopo, and I also sent them written instructions and asked them to send me 70 or 80 foot soldiers. The following day, 30th June, after hearing mass, there set out from our camp seven launches, more than 3,000 canoes of our allies, and I followed with 25 horsemen and all my foot soldiers and those who had come from Tucuba. And when we reached the city, I divided my force as follows. From the position we had already gained, there are three streets leading to the marketplace, or Tianguins, as the Indians call it, of Tlaltelolco. Along the principal street, I sent your majesty's treasurer and accountant, Julian de Alderete, with seventy men and fifteen or twenty thousand of our allies, and seven or eight horsemen as a rear guard, and as they carried the barricades, they were to fill in the bridge openings, and for this purpose, a dozen men carried mattocks, and all our allies were very useful at this work. The other two streets lead from the Tucuba Street to the marketplace, and they are narrower, and there are causeways with bridges and canals. By the broadest of these two, I ordered two captains to advance with eighty men and more than ten thousand Indian allies. At the entrance to the Tucuba Street, I posted two large cannon with eight horsemen to guard them. I myself, with eight horsemen and one hundred foot soldiers, including twenty-five crossbowmen and musketeers, and a great host of our allies, went on so as to advance along the narrow street as far as possible. At the entrance of the street, I halted the horsemen and ordered them to stay there and not to follow me unless I sent for them. Then I dismounted and we reached a barricade at the end of a bridge, and with the help of a small field piece and the musketeers and crossbowmen, we carried it and went along the causeway, which had been broken down in two or three places. In addition to the three lines of attack which we were following, our allies were so numerous that they swarmed over the Azateas in all directions, and it seemed as if nothing could harm us. As the Spaniards carried those bridges and barricades, our allies followed us along the causeway without making good, and I halted with about twenty Spaniards where there was an island, where I saw that some of our allies were surrounded by the enemy who sometimes drove them back and thrust them into the water, but with our help they rallied. In addition to this, we had to take care that the people of the city did not emerge from the cross streets and attack in the rear the Spaniards who had advanced along the street, and who at this time sent to tell me that they had made great gains and were not far from the marketplace, and that in any case they should press forward, for they already heard the noise of battle which Sandoval and Pedro Alvarado were waging from their side. I sent to tell them on no account to go ahead without first thoroughly filling in the bridge openings so that in case of retreat the water should not trouble or impede them, for they knew that there lay the greatest danger. They sent back to say that every place they had captured had been made good, and I could go there and verify it for myself. Having some misgivings, lest they might err and be wanting in caution about filling in the bridge openings, I went there and found that they had advanced across one breach in the street, which was ten or twelve paces in width, and the depth of the water that filled it was twice a man's height. In order to cross it, they had thrown in timber and bundles of reeds, and as they crossed with care a few at a time, the timber and reeds had not given way with them, and they, in the joy of victory, were so dull-witted as to think that it had left it quite firm. At the moment that I reached that wretched bridge, I saw that the Spaniards and many of our allies were retreating in full flight, with the enemy setting on them like dogs. And when I saw the great disaster, I began to shout, Hold on! And when I got to the water, I found it full of Spaniards and Indians, as though not a straw had been thrown into it. And the enemy, in order to kill the Spaniards, charged into the water after them. And canoes, manned by the enemy, came along the canals and carried off the Spaniards alive. The whole affair was so sudden that at seeing how the people were being killed, I determined to stay there and die fighting. 
All that I and those with me could do was to give a hand to some unfortunate Spaniards who were drowning and drag them out. Some got out wounded and others half drowned and others without arms, and we sent them to the rear. Then such numbers of the enemy charged on me and the dozen or fifteen Spaniards in my company that they completely surrounded us. As I was busy helping those who were drowning, I did not see or think of the danger we were in, and some of the Indians seized me and would have carried me off but for a captain of fifty, Cristobal de Olea, who always attended me, and a youth named Serma of his company, who after a god saved my life. Like the valiant man he was, Olea, in saving my life, lost his own. Meanwhile, the defeated Spaniards got along the causeway, and as it was small and narrow and on a level with the water, for the dogs had been careful to make it so, and many of our routed allies were pouring along it, it became so crowded that movement was slow, and the enemy had time to reach it by water on either side, and capture and kill at their will. A captain who was with me named Antonio Quinones said to me, Let us get away from here and save yourself, for you know that without you none of you will escape. But we could not prevail on me to go, and seeing this, he seized me by the arms to urge me to flight, and although I was better pleased with death than with life, at the urgency of that captain and other companions who were present, we began to retreat, fighting with our swords and shields against the enemy who came rushing against us. <clears throat> Then one of my servants arrived on horseback and cleared a small space, but at that moment from a roof he received a spear thrust in the throat which made him turn back. And while we were battling fiercely, waiting for the people to pass along that narrow causeway and gain safety and keeping back the enemy, another servant of mine brought the horse for me to mount. But such was the mud on the causeway from those who fell in and scrambled out of the water that no one could keep his feet all the more from the jostling of one against another in the efforts to save themselves. I mounted, but not with the intention of fighting on the causeway, for that was impossible on horseback, and if it could have been done, the eight horsemen whom I had left on the island at the entrance of the causeway would have done so, but they could do no more than retreat along it, and even this was dangerous enough and two mares ridden by two of my servants fell from the causeway into the water, and one being killed by the Indians and the other rescued by some foot soldiers. Another of my servants named Cristobal de Guzman mounted a horse on the island to bring it to me so that I could escape, but before reaching me the Indians killed both him and the horse. His death caused grief throughout the camp, and grief is still intense among those who knew him. Notwithstanding all these dangers, it pleased God that we who survived should reach the Calle de Tucuba, which is very broad, and collect the troops which I and nine horsemen formed a rear guard. The enemy came on so greatly elated by victory and pride, it seemed as though no one would be left alive, and retiring as best as I could, I sent to tell the treasurer and accountant to retreat to the plaza with great caution, and I sent to say the same to the other two captains who had advanced by the street leading to the marketplace. Both one and the other had fought valiantly and captured me. Backing up just a bit. Both one and the other had fought valiantly and captured many barricades and bridges which they had carefully filled in, which was the reason of their suffering no loss in their retreat. Before the treasurer and accountant retired, the people of the city from the barricade threw where they were fighting the heads of two or three Spaniards which they had cut off and the treasurer could not tell at the time if they came from our troops or from those of Pedro de Alvarado. We all got together in the plaza when such hosts of the enemy charged on us from all directions that it was all we could do to keep them off, at this in a place where before our defeat they did not dare to await the approach of three horsemen or ten foot soldiers. Then they promptly burned incense of perfumes and resins of the country on the summit of a lofty tower near the plaza as an offering to their idols and as a sign of victory. And however much we might wish to prevent it, nothing could be done, for already our people were hastening towards our camp. In this defeat, the enemy killed 35 or 40 Spaniards, and more than a thousand of our Indian allies, and I was wounded in the leg, and we lost a small field piece, and many crossbows, muskets, and other arms. We must now turn to Bernal Diaz's account of the happenings on the 30th June. As Cortez saw that it was impossible to fill in all the openings, bridges, and canals of water that we captured day by day, 
which the Mexicans reopened during the night and made stronger than they had been before with the barricades. It was very hard work fighting and filling in bridges and keeping watch all of us together. All the more as we were most of us wounded and twenty had died, he decided to consult his captains and soldiers who were in his camp. That is, Cristobal de Olid, Francisco Verdugo, André de Tapia, the Ensign Corral, and Francisco de Lugo. And he also wrote to us in the camp of Pedro de Alvarado and to the camp of Sandoval to take the opinion of all of us captains and soldiers. The question he asked was whether it seemed good to us to make an advance into the city with a rush so as to reach Tlatelolco, which is the great market of Mexico, and is much broader and larger than that of Salamanca, and that if we could reach it, whether it would be well to station all of our three camps there, as from thence we should be able to fight through the streets of Mexico without having such difficulty in retreating, and should not have so much to fill in or have to guard the bridges. As was likely to happen in such discussions and consultations, some of us said that it was not good advice or a good idea to intrude ourselves so entirely into the heart of the city, but that we should remain as we were, fighting and pulling down and leveling the houses. We who held the latter opinion gave as the most obvious reason for it that if we stationed ourselves in Tolte local and left the causeways and bridges unguarded and deserted, the Mexicans, having so many warriors and canoes, would reopen the bridges and causeways and we would no longer be masters of these. They would attack us with their powerful forces by night and day, and as they always had many impediments made with stakes ready prepared, our launches would not be able to help us. Thus, by the plan that Cortez was proposing, we would be the besieged, and the enemy would have possession of the land, the country, and the lake, and we wrote to him about his proposal so that it should not happen to us as it had happened before, as the saying of the Mazigatos runs, when we went fleeing out of Mexico. After Cortez had heard our opinions and the good reasons we gave for them, the only result of all the discussion was that on the following day we were to advance with all the energy we could from all three camps, horsemen as well as crossbowmen, musketeers and soldiers, and to push forward until we reached the great marketplace at Tlatelolco. When all was ready in all the three camps and our friends the Tlaxcalans had been warned, as well as the people of Texcoco, and those from the towns of the lake who had again given their fealty to his majesty, who were to come with their canoes to help the launches. One Sunday morning, 30th June, after having heard Mass, we set out from our camp with Pedro de Alvarado, and Cortez set out for his camp, and Sandoval with his companies, and in full force each company advanced, capturing bridges and barricades, and then we fought like brave warriors, and Cortez on his side gained many victories. So too did Gonzalo de Sandoval on his side. Then we were on our side and already captured another barricade and a bridge, which was done with much difficulty because Guatemoc had great forces guarding them. And we came out of the fight with many of our soldiers wounded, and one soon died of his wounds, and more than a thousand of our Tlaxcalan friends alone came out of it injured. However, we still followed up our victory very cheerfully. Bernal Diaz here gives an account of the disaster which overtook the division under Cortez, which has already been given in Cortez's own words. Let us, seek, uh, let us cease speaking about Cortez and his defeat, and return to our army, that of Pedro de Alvarado, and say how we advanced victoriously, and when we least expected it, we saw advancing against us with loud yells very many squadrons of Mexicans, with very handsome ensigns and plumes, and... They cast in front of us five heads streaming with blood, which they had just cut off the men whom they had captured from Cortez. And they cried, Thus will we kill you all, as we have killed Malinche and Sandoval, and all whom they had brought with them. And these are their heads, and by them you may know them well. And saying these words, they closed in on us until they laid hands on us, and neither cut, nor thrust, nor crossbows, nor muskets availed to stop them. All they did was to rush at us as at a mark. Even so, we lost nothing of our order in retreating, for we had once commanded our friends the Clash Callans to clear off quickly from the causeways and bad passages, and this time they did it with a will. For when they saw the five heads of our companions dripping with blood and heard the Mexicans say that they had killed Malinche and Sandoval and all the tools whom they had brought with them, and that so they would do to us also and to the Tlaxcalans, they were thoroughly frightened, thinking it was true. And for this reason, I say, they cleared off the causeway very completely. 
As we were retreating, we heard the sound of trumpets from the great queue, which from its height dominates the whole city, and also a drum, a most dismal sound indeed. It was like an instrument of demons, as it resounded so that one could hear it two leagues off, and with it many small tambourines and shell trumpets, horns and whistles. At that moment, as we afterwards learnt, they were offering the hearts of ten of our companions and much blood to the idols. Simultaneously there came against us many squadrons which Guatemoc had newly sent out, and he ordered his horn to be sounded. When this horn was sounded, it was a signal that his companions, or captains and warriors, must fight so as to capture their enemies or die in the attempt, and the sound that it made echoed in their ears, and when his captains and squadrons heard it, they, their fury and courage with which they threw themselves at us in order to lay hold of us was terrifying, and I do not know how to describe it here. Even now, when I stop to remember, it is as though I could see it all this minute, and were present again in that fight and battle. But I reassert that our Lord Jesus Christ saved us, for if we had not given us strength, seeing that we were all wounded, we should never otherwise have been able to reach our ranchos. And I give thanks and praise to God for it that I escaped that time, with many others from the power of the Mexicans. To go back to our story... The horsemen made charges, and with two heavy cannon that we placed near our ranchos with some loading while others fired, we held our own, for the causeway was crowded to the utmost of the enemy, and they came after us up to the houses as though we were already conquered, and shot javelins and stones at us, and as I have said, with those cannon we killed many of them. The man who was most helpful that day was a gentleman named Pedro Moreno Medrano, for he acted as gunner because the artillerymen we used to have with us or some of them dead, and others wounded, and Pedro Moreno, besides always being a brave soldier, was on that day a great help to us. Being as we were in that condition, thoroughly miserable and wounded, we knew nothing of either Cortez or Sandoval, nor of their armies, whether they had been killed or routed, as the Mexicans told us that they were, when they cast before us the five heads which they brought tied together by the hair and the beards, saying that Malinche and all the two were already dead and that thus they were going to kill all of us that very day. We were not able to get news from them because we were fighting half a league apart one from another, and for this very reason we were much distressed. But by all of us both wounded and sound, keeping together in a body, we held out against the shock of the fury of the Mexicans who came against us, and who did not believe that there would be a trace of us left after the attack that they made upon us. Then they had already captured one of our launches and killed three soldiers and wounded the captain and most of the soldiers who were in it, and it was rescued by another launch on which Juan Jaramillo was captain. Yet another launch was impaled in a place from which it could not move, and its captain was Juan de Limpias Caravajal, who went deaf at that time. He himself fought most valiantly and so encouraged his soldiers who were rowing the launch that day that they broke the stakes on which they were impaled and got away all badly wounded, and saved the launch. This Limpius was the first to break the stakes, and it was a great thing for all of us. Cortez sent under the Tapia with three horsemen post-haste by land, at the risk of their lives, to our camp, to find out if we were alive. The captain under the Tapia made great haste, although he and two of those who came with him were wounded. When they reached our camp and found us fighting with the Mexican force, which was still close to us, they rejoiced in their hearts and related to us what had happened about the defeat of Cortez. However, they did not care to state that so many were dead, and said that about twenty-five had been killed, and that all the rest were well. <laughs>